Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about art, money, and desire. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've really been dealing with in my own response to the art world is uh, a little bit the same kind of idea of paradox that um, John Dalton was talking about. And for me, the paradox is that a lot of the things that I think are really interesting, incredibly interesting developments, um, things that really drove me to really to be um, to study art, to be engaged with it, also can be exploited, can be turned into uh, the opportunities for uh, entertainment, for um, a sort of art world and social scene. So, you know, conceptual art, more ephemeral practices, installation practices, all of these are things that really brought me into studying art and thinking about art, but that also have become part of a kind of biennial culture and a culture that is, uh, turns art into a kind of entertainment or social uh, 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 sort of site for social activity. Another part of what I'm thinking about today is really the high end of the art world, because obviously there's an incredible divergence. Um, most artists don't make much money from their art. Uh, a lot of dealers don't make a lot of money. There are a lot of very idealistic art dealers out there. Um, but the top end of the art world skews things. And so um, it's thinking about that the top end and the sort of the, the influence of money at the top end of the art world that I'm, I'm focusing on a little bit today. And there's also a kind of paradox there in that uh, a certain amount, to a certain degree, the amount of money that's poured into the art world is based on the idea that art is somehow priceless. So the, the paradox of an incredible amount of money, an incredible volume of resources being uh, justified based on the idea of this uh, art itself somehow being beyond price. And those resources are not just about uh, the sales price of art, they're also about preservation, um, they're about the, the, the kind of support that we give for the institutions that display art, um, the uh, legal support for artwork, including moral rights protection that says the work of art is more than simply another, another object, another commodity. Basically, there's, there's a, a very small part of the art world that you could think of as sort of investment grade. Um, and a very small part of the art world, uh, the, the, uh, the art that's going to wind up in a museum, and even with the work that does wind up in a museum, even there, there's a kind of a disproportionate uh, allocation of resources in terms of what gets the intensive preservation activity. So one thing I'm going to talk about today is desire. And I'm going to get at that through this somewhat, um, I think, very ambiguous object. And the desire uh, is this for me is evident in the incredible amount of attention, incredible resources that are poured into certain artists' work and into showing the work, into preserving the work, and in certain cases, even to extending the work. And so what you're looking at here is, I very carefully titled it, um, it's not Robert Smithson's Floating Island, but it's Floating Island based on a drawing by Robert Smithson in, uh, that he created in 1970, and just three years before his untimely death in 73. And it was created in 2005, and it was created to coincide with the uh, retrospective of Smithson's work at the Whitney Museum of Art. And it was funded by a number of different uh, entities. Uh, uh, the gallery that handles the Smithson estate, the James Cohan Gallery, was um, uh, responsible for raising or uh, supplying most of the money to uh, create this work. It was uh, reported as co uh, costing about $200,000. But the Cohan Gallery was also working with um, the Minetta Brook organization, with the Whitney, uh, and with... Um, Nancy Holt, Smithson's widow and executor in the creation of this. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is that this, this is an object that, that only existed for nine days, but there was this incredible willingness to pour these resources into creating this thing that 
as I say, has a very ambiguous existence. We can't really call it a Smithson work. It's very loosely based on a Smithson drawing that was, in its original form, quite ambiguous. So Smithson referred to weeping willows, uh, trees common to the region, path, bushes, moss, rock. Uh, but basically, the final form was uh, a form that was determined by others, uh, determined uh, uh, based largely uh, by the decisions of Nancy Holt. So I guess the first issue is this question of desire. Um, why this, this work reappeared. And for me, that, that issue of desire also sort of came back to me in the sense that I had a lot of doubts about this, but I also really wanted to see it. Uh, so, and it actually was kind of a problem to see it because it was off schedule. So I, uh, you know, I looked at the schedule, I went down to the lower tip of Manhattan, and I spent a lot of time staring out into New York Harbor, yeah. waiting, waiting, waiting for this thing. And it was sort of, it's a, it's a really big harbor, and then, so I, was, I kept looking at these objects and not sure whether, oh, maybe that's it, maybe not. And so at a certain point, I thought that, in fact, this photograph was going to be my sole document of not finding the floating island. So, but I did actually uh, manage to catch up with it later, so actually uh, get a chance to see the, the tugboat operator make it uh, pirouette in this, uh, around this uh, pier. And so, you know, this, this issue for me became one of, you know, my own desire to see the work, which in part had to do with the sense of Smithson's own project being so incomplete. That incomplete because of his early death, also incomplete because of uh, seeing it in the museum meant seeing films, seeing uh, photographs, because obviously so many of his incredibly important works were not something that could actually be uh, exhibited themselves in the museum. But then there's also this other uh, part of the work, which is that this is a, a very evident example of the fact that Smithson's work is continuing to be made. So there are actually editions being put out of his photographs. And so another part of this is the idea that we, the later audience, we, we want uh, something from this artist. And we, in a, this broad sense, therefore actually will change the artist's work and continue the artist's work. And in that sense, make the artist's work, or make the artist, make our understanding of the artist conform with our own uh, present desire. And so I do think that in subtle as well as dramatic ways, uh, you, what you see here has to do with an ongoing process of making the work that doesn't end punctually with some uh, original date. Then the other part of what I want to say today has to do with the idea of certain artists being perhaps too big to fail. And so <laughs> this idea of that, that these resources would be poured into Smithson's work, uh, into making this, this very elaborate object based on a possibly somewhat offhand drawing uh, speaks to the idea that, that Smithson has, this, has been granted this incredible importance. And that also, though, is a, a, an importance based on a, a retrospective look. So the other part of this idea of too big to fail, I think it can be applied to contemporary artists and artists where you have this incredible market hype surrounding their current production. And so you have here t examples of two of what I would say are the big three in that regard, Damien Hirst, Jeff Koons, and Takashi Murakami. And what I'm showing you here are billboards in Chelsea, uh, billboards for Sotheby's auctions. And of course, they are these perfectly targeted advertisements. Uh, Chelsea is this uh, sort of upscale out outdoor art gallery mall, so that they can, uh, the, the ads are uh, basically targeted to uh, this very specific uh, um, audience of art, work, art world cognoscenti that, that uh, congregate in Chelsea. 
Um, but I think it's one of the other thing that's really appro appropriate about these billboards is that they are advertising the uh, work of artists who really have blurred distinctions between fine and commercial work and made them seem increasingly irrelevant. From Jeff Koons's over-the-top, very lavishly produced um, kitsch objects to Damien Hirst's uh, infamous diamond, diamond skull and also the dot paintings that were uh, shown to such fanfare in uh, all 11 of Gagosian's galleries in eight different cities across three different continents at the beginning of this year. But the artist that I think is most, uh, uh, it, uh, takes this idea of blurring these distinctions to the greatest extreme is uh, Murakami. And that is evident here in uh, the retrospective of Murakami's work that was at uh, uh, LAC, the LA MOCA, and then at the Brooklyn Museum. And the fact that this uh, Louis Vuitton boutique was actually included in the galleries. So you had this, this, this boutique that, uh, for Murakami, was a, just evidence that this work was continuous with his, his production more generally. Um, again, going to this idea of a, kind of a gala production, they're also at the for the Brooklyn opening, the, uh, they, they also recreated a version of the Canal Street uh, shops that used to sell uh, Louis Vuitton knockoffs, but were selling the actual real thing in those uh, uh, versions of Canal Street shops. But also, I think, as what was interesting about that was that the boutiques were simply uh, something in the gallery that, that reflects what happens at the end of most exhibitions anyway, which is the gift shop selling all these trinkets, and Murakami is himself very much adept at that, in that the, uh, here what you see at the uh, Brooklyn Museum gift shop is his own Kai Kai Kiki Corporation trinkets. So he's actually making the trinkets that are in the gift shop, and the, the audience was quite incredible for the amount of Murakami gear they were wearing for the fact that they were clearly dividing up their purchases so they could get as many Murakami print shopping bags as possible. Um, so it, you know, in a sense, he has managed to talk to all levels of the potential market for his work. And so in the end, I think that's, for me, I'm not sure, uh, again, how much distinction I would make here either. I mean, I'm, I'm not in a league that can consider paying 15 million plus for the, the sculpture that you see in the billboard on the left, which is how much it went for at auction during the same time that the retrospective was up. Um, but I also couldn't imagine paying $49 for that little plush pillow. But um, obviously both of those speak to this idea of the Murakami brand and the branding that is part of the art world that is also very continuous with the rest of our existence. Thank you.